Hello everybody, my name is Ammar Halabi. I come from Syria and what I hope to do in this uh, couple of minutes is give a glimpse of the open source and hardware and maker communities in the Arab world. So I'll, I'll start to put things in context with a story of a, an open hardware community in Syria called Fablojo, which is one of several open hardware communities in the region. So in early 2012, I was lucky to, uh, to witness the establishment of a local interest group in Damascus that was called, and still is called, luckily, the Open Hardware Group, and I'm translating the title from Arabic. And it was just a group of university students coming together, interested in the topic of open hardware, um, holding weekly activities, um, holding talks about latest news in open hardware, what open hardware can do. They established a group on Facebook to exchange news about open hardware. And from early on, they were interested in um, doing things with Arduino. Arduino, that time, was just entering the scene in the Middle East. So they exchanged, one, one of the two most active members in the group exchanged the one Arduino board that was available at that time. They tinkered a little bit with it, and then they made a couple of small projects. One of them, for example, was a um, blinker that would blink whenever you get an email on Gmail. So they held a talk, and they presented these two projects to their fellow students. And these simple two projects sparked so much enthusiasm that they needed to found a new group that is more local in Damascus called Fablogia that was specifically targeted uh, towards bringing people interested in, interested in making together to do tangible hardware workshops in Damascus. So they found the group over there, they started at, they started pledging for, for funding, getting support to buy the boards. Finally, they managed to do that. And then they had enough Arduino boards to start doing workshops for youth, for their peer um, colleagues within the university. Last year, which is 2013, during the spring, they also contributed to uh, founding Hackerspace Damascus, um, where activities basically were the same, but they just got more regular on a weekly basis. And they managed to, to, uh, to equip this space with workbenches, with, with electronic parts. So whatever you want to, to I mean, whatever you need to, to have in, in order to work with tinkering with hardware. Now, this is quite recently what happened is that one of the active members in that community um, got with his colleagues and then established a small business called Atadiyat, where one of their flagship uh, product, products were um, was um, creating a local version of the uh, of the Arduino that is possible to make using local parts that one can buy in Syria because they had this problem that um, although the, the the bill of products is quite obvious you can in principle get uh, get the parts that you need for building your own cloning your own version of Arduino but still they had the difficulties that they couldn't get everything in the local market. So they had to also to work on creating their own version with parts that they can get in Syria. So now this trajectory from creating a, a community towards establishing the community, establishing a physical space, and then one, one business sprouts out of this kind of setup is only one story among several stories within several communities in the Middle East and the Arab region. So to prepare this talk, we talked with pioneers in open hardware in the Arab world, in the Arab-speaking world, from Egypt, from Jordan, from Syria, and from Palestine. To, and they, they come from, all of them have strong connections with locally established communities. Some of them have already established businesses. So I'll tell you next what came up out of these conversations that we had together. So first, a very brief history of, of how open hardware found its way to the region, is that in the early 2000s, there were the, the early pioneers that were mainly inspired by the open source software movement. And actually, if you kind of talk, it's mostly the case that when you talk to people who are really active in open hardware in the region, they mostly come from background that they got influenced by open source software first. 
these, so the early pioneers are people also who got contact with very early um, hardware, open hardware communities like the opencores.org and they got active on there and then they started in kind of localizing the ideas and the concept of open hardware in the region. In the mid 2000s was um, when the Arduino made its entry and um, it contributed as it did everywhere else to boosting um, the movement by providing a platform that's very accessible. Afterwards, something happened, which is internet and social media, also kind of, let's say, in the late 2000s, which is quite later than what happened in the Western world, is that um, internet got more towards more broader audiences, which meant that everybody could get online, get read about open source literature and get ideas how to make that happen. Connect with each other as well, which is very important. And now, recently, very recently, uh, is that open hardware communities are sprouting in different places in the Arab world and for the first time, I mean, not very first time anymore, but back to two years and till now, we're seeing the first attempts to establish local businesses based on open hardware. So today, today, um, there's content. There are people working on translating and authoring content to Arabic, which is a very important thing because it's a wholly different linguistic community. So there are people who are working on translating um, blog posts, articles, authoring books. And I would like to especially mention here the book that you see in the front, which is, um, it's called, um, well, actually the one behind it, which is the Simply Arduino book, which had a very specific, very interesting impact in the Arab world. And I just met a friend who, who um, from Egypt, and they did a survey, and they mentioned that 30% of people who they interviewed with the survey knew about the Arduino from this book who was authored by Abdullah Ali. So these pioneers who are translating and authoring content in Arabic are really opening the way for other people to enter the scene. Now, the, 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 the type of content on the lift is, is mostly technical in the sense is that it, it enables people to learn how to work with open hardware platforms, to learn how to use the part. But on the other hand side, we also have content like manuals, blog posts, visionary articles. And they are visionary, visionary in the sense is that they talk about open hardware as a movement and as a philosophy. And they think about how they can strategically um, employ open hardware for local development. And um, the, as one could expect, the, the, the biggest percentage of the content is, morely te is more technical and then a small percentage is rather visionary. And of course, there are people who kind of write within the both spheres. Now, there are also community of sharing. And here I take uh, screenshots of Facebook pages, which um, is very, I mean, used a lot by open hardware communities in the region to kind of bring people together, announce events, um, share uh, news about open hardware, or gather technical support. And if you also visit these types of online sites or, or Facebook pages, you can also see uh, the, almost the same dynamic with content, is that mostly people are seeking technical um, support, and there is much less visionary type of content that goes on there talking about open hardware as a movement itself. Lots of these sharing communities also have physical spaces, um, which is quite important. Like the Fab Lab in Egypt, like the hackerspace in Damascus, or the hackerspace of Amman, and other hackerspaces in Morocco, in Tunisia, and Saudi Arabia. And most of them actually suffer from the problem of finding a sustainable setup such that they can continue working on the long term, um, like funding issues or people who are running the, the space uh, 
they get to work, they marry and have kids, and they don't have any time anymore. So it's, it's a struggle currently to figure out models such that these kind of spaces can thrive and continue. I would mention here that the Fab Lab in Egypt kind of found an interesting uh, subscription-based model that, are, that is helping them to, to strive so far. So it's interesting to see where this is going and if these spaces will die and then others will sprout, which is the natural way of life, or if we need to work on something that's more sustainable. Now, quite straightforward, the role of open hardware platforms is very, very vital. So literally Arduino made it possible for people to have a single platform that they can work around and that they can build a, a kind of critical mass of people that come together and work on this platform. Now recently also the, the Raspberry Pi is entering the scene, but the, the, the Arduino is so popular actually that it made it, it, it's now the main platform that even university students would use for their term projects because it's much easier to use it to deal with a microcontroller micro than not using it. Um, also apparently making things tangible is um, popularizing the, the movement. So most of the physical spaces in the Arab world currently either have plans to get, uh, uh, to get CNC cutters, millers, or, or, or 3D printers, or have already got them. Now, there is an issue is that so far, so far, I mean, up to my knowledge, I haven't personally seen innovation using these types of, of, of gadgets, but they are at least helping people come, because they are interesting, they are tangible, they are very physical. Okay, now very recently and on the um, online of the theme of this conference this year, is that there are businesses um, starting to emerge based on open hardware, like um, Genotronics in, in Jordan, um, One Shield in, in Egypt, Atadiyat in Syria, and Ishtri in, in Jordan again. Now, if you look at all these businesses, mostly the way, um, I mean, people who found them are people who are already involved in open hardware communities, in, in the culture of sharing. And they also mostly target people who are within the maker community. So three out of these projects, actually, uh, are three businesses, they sell... Um, open source hardware to the maker community. So the business model is based on the community itself. Now, an exception to this is the One Shield project, which is um, actually, Amr is somewhere in the audience, so he's here if you want to talk to him. Um, they led a uh, startup campaign, successful startup campaign, and they targeted an international market. So they built a shield that you can stick to the Arduino, and then you can use it, then you can uh, benefit from the, the sensors and the actuators in your smartphone. And for that, it has a, it, it has a different profit model, uh, but it still targets the maker community. So a question that is still open, whether the open hardware businesses that are emerging in the region can innovate to target local needs outside of the maker community like in agriculture, healthcare, um, you name it. So this growth faces challenges. And this, this I'll, I'll list a couple of points that were echoed by many of the pioneers that we have talked to. So first, there is no industrial infrastructure in the region. It means that people studying engineering or or uh, people that are hobbyists in, in, in electronics, they don't have the chance to practice their skills. They end up working in sales or in promotion of selling um, electronic stuff. So th there is no possibility to, uh, to extend uh, the skills. Also, the legal infrastructure is virtually not there. So there is no choice or flexibility about using or um, appropriating open hardware licenses and protect them if you build a business on open hardware. Um, also, consumerism is very entrenched in the Arab world, such that we are very used to buying things from, from China, from Japan, from Germany. I mean, made in Germany or made in China, it's something that you can trust. But 
made in Syria. It's something that you would try to avoid buying. So convincing people to trust locally made stuff, locally designed stuff, is a hurdle that need, needs also to be kind of overtaken. Language is still a huge issue. Although there are people who are authoring and translating, they are very few. And the content in Arabic, we still need to work on that. So, and more aware, awareness raising, therefore, is required. Especially that um, the success of Arduino has brought so many people to the open hardware movement, such that they came for the practical benefits, which is fine, but it meant that they're not contributing back. I mean, Arduino now is just another gadget that's easy to use as anything else, whether closed or open. So there is an untapped potential for these people if we could find a way to also involve them in the making and sharing process. Last. Okay. The economic and humanitarian conditions which make it quite hard to follow up with anything currently in the region. So the last thing, because I already kind of probably overpassed my time a lot, is that we come with a couple of messages is that we're now building an open directory that contains people working on open hardware and business, businesses in the region. So help us spread it, help us organize Maker Fair uh, locally, and that's it. So any type of feedback or opinions are welcome. Thank you very much.